Hey, everyone. Welcome to another Mama Bear Apologetics podcast. We are so glad that you're joining us here. If you're here, it's because you have survived this merciless summer. So props to you. And you are now getting kiddos off to school. It's probably a little quieter around your house. And so we're so excited that you are joining us today because we have with us the amazing Frank Turek. Yes, and I bring my own my own audience with me, Amy. I know they're they're in the background. You just can't see them. It's like an episode. That's of right. Seinfeld. That's right. They're here. Yeah, the amazing. Yeah, absolutely. The amazing. So it's great because he has. You've got this great book out now, uh, Hollywood Heroes, which is so perfect because we here at Mama Bear we love. There it is. It is awesome. My kiddos were so excited, by the way. I'm like, oh, we're going to be talking about Iron Man and Captain America. Uh My 12 year old was like, I think I should really be there. And I'm like, "Eh." (laughs) but this book is great because we at Mama Bear, we love incorporating culture and movies into teaching moments because it's so Mm -hmm. practical to kids. Mm -hmm. Because so often, you know, maybe what isn't coming across as clearly throughout uh, scripture, boy, if you can tie it into a movie, the light just goes off. Oh, totally. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we wrote it. And I wrote it with my son, my eldest son, who is a movie buff himself. He's already a seminary grad, even though he's a major in the Air Force. And and I don't know, five or six years ago, we just got talking and he knew the movie so well. I said, Zach, there's so many parallels to the Christian worldview in many of these movies. And so many of the heroes in these movies are modeled after the ultimate hero, Jesus of Nazareth that we could write a book about this. So it took us a while because he's working full time, probably 60 hours a week now doing what he's doing. And of course, I'm busy, too. But we finally got the book done. It's called Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And we go through the big uh, sort of blockbuster movies that have occurred over the past couple of decades, maybe even four decades Mm-hmm. Now, because we go all the way back to Star Wars, as you know, Amy, but we cover <laughs> Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter. I know Christians are going, Harry Potter? Oh. You'll be surprised. Maybe, maybe, yes. maybe we can talk about it. Yeah. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, uh, Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman and Spider-Man are in there, too. And they all point to the ultimate hero, Jesus of Nazareth. That Yeah, no. And I love that because I. We actually, it's funny, we actually got some, some emails sometime from people who were, we got chastised because I, I referenced Harry Potter. There's a, there's a scene where he's talking to Dolores Umbridge, who is just this merciless headmaster of Hogwarts. And uh, she's giving him this very juvenile textbooks on defense against the dark arts. And he goes, wait, we need to know how to defend ourselves. And she goes, why would you need to know how to defend yourself? Your children, who's going to come after you? And I mentioned how this is a perfect parallel to how people don't think kids are on the battlefield when it comes to Mm. scripture and spirituality. And no, Mm. they are. And they don't need to be coddled and put in this Christian bubble. Instead, they need to be tactically engaging with what culture is marketing directly toward them. Because so many parents, they don't start equipping their kids until they're middle school, high school, when the world has been evangelizing them from the time they're toddlers. And we had people who were like, how can you reference Harry Potter? And it's like, look, if the demons can recognize Jesus, secular sources can point to Christ. That's right. Exactly. And in fact, with regard to Harry Potter, I don't know uh, J.K. Rowling's personal salvation, if she's saved or not, Mm. but she claims to be a member of the Church of England. And maybe a little bit later, we can talk about she got a lot of what's in her story from the Bible. She admits it. Yeah. Yeah. No, Mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. Hopefully we do get to touch on that. So Mm -hmm. of course, you know, this first question here that that we got to tackle of, uh, you know, why does this world need this book now? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think as you just mentioned that kids are and older people too, are just infatuated with movies. We just Mm -hmm. love a good story. We love it. Well presented. We love special effects. We love a good versus evil. We love all that stuff. And there, there is a way to take these movies that really resonate with people and show how the same thing is going on in the, in, in the real world, the Christian real world, the way things really are, the story of reality, as my friend Greg Kokel would say, we can take those stories that we're so infatuated with and say they point to the ultimate story. In fact, they're actually stolen to a certain extent from the ultimate story, the story of Jesus. I mean, why are we so excited when we see something on the big screen where a hero comes in, he rescues people from evil and takes them to a place of bliss. 
because that's really what we want to happen in our lives. We want to be rescued from this world of pain and suffering and taken to a place of bliss. And that's what all these superhero and fantasy movies do. They're actually mapping over what God has put on our hearts. He's put eternity on our hearts and he we we all want to be rescued. And that's what Christianity does. Christianity rescues us from this world of pain and suffering. Yeah. No, I had that exact same thought. Have you seen the movie Inside Out? I don't know if I've seen that. When when was that? Is that recent? Uh, well, it's not recent. It's probably, gosh, no, maybe five years ago, five, six years okay. ago, Pixar. Um, uh-huh. So this movie, it, it's, fant- it's fantastic, entertaining, clever. It's about how uh, within each person is, you know, five core emotions. And so these little emotions, uh, you've got Amy Poehler playing happiness. And then you've got the, the one gal from The Office playing sadness. And so they uh-huh. go on this little adventure. It's hilarious. Um, Inside and out. Yeah, right. to go on this adventure. But um, there's the, a part in the movie where uh, if if a child starts forgetting things, it gets thrown into this abyss and it eventually just fades away. And she's got this imaginary friend, Bing Bong. And so Joy and Bing Bong end up in this, this abyss of forgottenness and they're trying to get out. And uh, what they realize is they can take this wagon and, and launch it off this ramp and, and finally escape. But toward the end of it, Bing Bong realizes that with him in the wagon, he they won't make it. And so Hmm. at the very last minute, he uses his weight to get the wagon up and it launches and he jumps out at the last minute and Joy doesn't know. And he completely sacrifices himself for Joy and she makes it out of there, but he's lost. And everybody, when I was watching it with my kiddos, I look around the theater and everybody is in tears and they're sobbing Hmm. and crying. And I'm Hmm. looking around, I'm like, do you realize why you're crying? You're crying because you see Jesus in this. And and it's like, they didn't realize that. I I wanted to be super rude and like yell in the church, be like, this is Jesus, (laughs) y'all. Well, people always ask me, Amy, what is the common thread that runs through all the heroes and fantasy movies that we cover in Hollywood heroes? And the common theme is sacrifice. Yeah. Every one of the superheroes and every one of the heroes we like in these movies sacrifices themselves to save others, which is, of course, what Jesus does for us. I mean, from Captain America to Iron Man to Harry Potter to Luke Skywalker to uh, to Frodo in Lord of the Rings to. Uh, to Batman, to Wonder Woman, they all sacrifice. Uh, Spider Man, they all sacrifice. Uh, Superman, I, they just keep coming to my head. They yeah. all sacrifice to save people from evil, and that's what Jesus does for us. Yeah. So, is there a great way to get your kids more interested in God and Christianity? Yeah, there is through the movies. If they look, I, we tell them, look, if you like Superman, you're gonna love Jesus. If you like <laughs> Iron Man, you're gonna love Jesus. If you like Harry Potter, you're gonna love Jesus. It's 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 a direct line in many cases from these characters right to Jesus. Yeah, no. And I, I completely agree. Now I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off script here. Mm-hmm. Now there are some parents who are hesitant to have their yes. kids uh, watch these type of movies. My son, yeah. um, he's 12, you know, he had a classmate who they were, they were talking about uh, watching, you know, Iron Man. Cause my son loves Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a big engineer. And you know, this kid was, Oh, you can't watch that. That, that is mm-hmm. a sinful mm-hmm. show and you can't watch it. So mm-hmm. I know there are parents that, that maybe yeah. have maybe a, a heightened sense of conviction toward these movies. Mm-hmm. So what sort of encouragements would you, would you offer for maybe, you know, interacting with something that may not be veggie tales related? Yeah. Here's what I say to them. I say, I trust you with your kid more than I trust me. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, your kid better than me. And so if you think something's inappropriate or something that is going to turn your kid away from Christianity, or is going to be a problem with regard to sin, then, then shield them from it, but at least educate them on it. Like for example, let's take Harry Potter for a second. A lot of people are concerned about the so-called witchcraft in Harry Potter. Although I've noticed that a lot of Christians who don't like Harry Potter love Lord of the Rings and Narnia when they right. also have witchcraft in them. And you're going, wait a minute, why? <laughs> you know, you got to have a double standard here, but let's leave that aside. Okay. What you ought to do, even if, if you don't want your kids watching it, you should at least let them know the storyline and what goes on in there. Why? Because their friends are into Harry Potter. And if their friends are into Harry Potter, you can use the Harry Potter story to direct them to Jesus. This is an evangelism tool now. You don't have to watch it yourself, but at least know what what goes on. And look, in Harry Potter, Amy, Harry Potter, in fact, we say this in the book Hollywood Heroes in the chapter on Harry Potter. We say, arguably, Harry Potter 
has more in common with Jesus than any other character in modern fiction. Let me just give you four parallels. Okay. Four parallels. Okay. Here are the four parallels. First of all, Harry Potter uh, is prophesied to be the savior of his world before he's born and an evil force tries to kill him as an infant. Does that Mm. sound familiar? Very familiar. Secondly, Harry Potter has to live a moral life to be the savior of his world. Thirdly, he sacrifices himself in order to defeat the Satan figure Voldemort. Mm. And then fourthly, he rises from the dead and his followers have to put their faith in him to ultimately defeat Voldemort. Does this Mm. sound familiar at all? This is the Christian story, right? Prophecy, morality, sacrifice and resurrection. And when, when JK Rowling was asked, uh, you know, why do you have these biblical verses in the story? There are two biblical verses in the story that are, they appear on gravestones, I think. Mm. And she says, these two verses epitomize the whole series. Here they are. The first is from first Corinthians 15, which says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And the other comes from Jesus's sermon on the Mount, where he says, where your heart is, your treasure will be also, or where your treasure mm. is, that's where your heart will be also. Yeah. And she says, those two, those two verses, which appear in the story mm-hmm. are really, they epitomize the whole story. She said, but I never wanted to talk about this because I didn't want to tip off our readers as to where the story was going because yeah. she's basically lifted the basic elements of the Bible and the story of Jesus and, and applied them to her own uh, wizardry world. Yeah. And the kind of wizardry, by the way, that goes on in Harry Potter is not the kind generally that the Bible talks about. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible doesn't think that people can get on broomsticks and fly around and play this modified soccer game that they play in Harry Potter. Right. Right. It's if this is all wow, gee whiz stuff made up out of J.K. Rowling's mind. I think there's one instance where they do try and contact the dead in the last movie, but it doesn't go anywhere. But generally, this is not the kind of the occult the Bible's talking about. This is made up fantasy stuff out of J.K. Rowling's mind, just like it's made up fantasy stuff out of George Lucas's mind that Yoda can levitate a spaceship. Right. We don't Mm. think anybody can do that in real life, whether you're into the occult or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I I actually spent time uh, pursuing Wicca as a, as a high schooler. And even within Wiccan circles, like that was when Harry Potter was really starting to come out and, and begin its heyday. And and we knew the difference, right? That this is not Uh the same thing as what we know of as Wicca today. So yeah, really interesting. So, I mean, it, it really just debunks this whole claim that fictional stories uh, can't be used to teach biblical truths. They very much can. Well, let me say that, uh, if people say that you can't use fictional stories to teach biblical truths, then they've just indicted both Paul and Jesus. Right. Why? Because Paul, when he's on Mars Hill in Athens in about 51 AD, he's speaking not to Jews, but he's speaking to Greek unbelievers. And who does he quote in order to get them to consider the resurrection? Quotes their own Greek poets. Mm. He quotes the movies of their day. He doesn't quote the Old Testament scriptures because they don't even believe in the Old Testament. He's using their stories as a bridge to the gospel. So they're not he doesn't think what the the Greek poets, uh, everything they've said are true. He's just using what they said that are true to point to the gospel. And Jesus, by the way, does this on about 39 occasions. What are the 39 occasions? They're called parallel uh, parables. Right. When Jesus tells a parable, he's not saying this is a true historical story. Like if you were there when Jesus told the the Good Samaritan parable, Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to say, hey, Jesus, what was the Good Samaritan's name? He's not going to go. His name was Bob. Right. (laughs) He's not going to say that because he's not saying that this really happened. He's just using a fictional story to communicate a truth about morality or theology. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus can do that. Why can't we do that? Why can't we illustrate a truth through a fictional story? Jesus does it all the time. Absolutely. And that's the brilliance of it, because when you interact with someone, especially who's from a secular background, and especially if they're hostile toward Christianity, whenever you Mm -hmm. can use a movie, a story, a parallel that doesn't overtly quote scripture or point to Christianity, you get them thinking. And that's the goal, right? Is because when we yeah, train people yeah. to recognize truth, since God is truth, they will, re- they will run into Jesus every single time. And that's the beauty of these stories. Oh, they will. If, 
they're open to it. And if, right. if they look at it long enough, they're going to realize, well, wow, this is more than just entertainment. And let me say something here, Amy, I'm not saying all of these screenwriters were Christians or even intended to put Christian themes in it, but yeah. they can't help it. Why? Yeah. Because they're living in God's world too. And they know what resonates with an audience and what doesn't. Can I give you an example from Iron Man? Please do. Okay. Iron Man, as you know, starts out as a billionaire playboy, amoral arms dealer. Classic. He's, he's got everything you think you would want to be happy. He's got the big three. And we Mm -hmm. explain this in the book, by the way, one of the things we do in the book, Hollywood heroes is we weave apologetics and biblical life lessons right into the descriptions of these movies. Mm -hmm. So young people, when they're reading them are going to get uh, good apologetic lessons and biblical life lessons by reading the book. Anyway, Perfect. Um, the, he's got the big three. Tony Stark does. What are the big three we think that are going to make us happy? Uh, we've got uh, we've got to have a good relationship. So we got to have what the, the culture would say. We've got to have a good sexual life, a good sex life. Right. We've got to have money and we've got to have power, sex, money and power. Those are the three things that we think are going to make us happy. And Tony Stark has all that, but he's still miserable. Yeah. Why is he miserable? Well, because he's got everything to live with and nothing to live for. He's got no identity. He's got no purpose. He doesn't know what life's about. And then one of the weapons he sells to uh, be a terrorist detonates near him and puts shrapnel in his chest. And he has to have a device installed into his chest to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. If that device fails, he dies. Now, for me, this is a beautiful illustration of what I think is the second most important verse in the entire Bible to this generation right now, Amy. The most important set of verses has to do with the gospel. This is the second most important verse. It's it's Proverbs 4.23, and it says this, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Notice it doesn't say follow your heart. Mm. If you follow your heart, you're going to wind up like the playboy Tony Stark. You're going to be full of anxiety, lonely. You're going to be miserable. You're not going to have any purpose. But if you guard your heart and follow the truth, then you can ultimately find contentment and achievement. And that's what Tony Stark does. He goes on this long character arc where he ultimately becomes a hero. And at the end of Endgame, spoiler alert, he sacrifices himself in order order to defeat the Satan figure, Thanos. Now, the I don't know about you, but I love the the, the Tony Stark character. I thought that yeah. Robert Downey Jr. played him brilliantly. Perfect. And when he died at the end, I was almost getting choked up. I'm going, this guy, he's like my favorite. What happened? He's dead now, right? Mm-hmm. But could you imagine, Amy, if the movie writers got to the end of Endgame and they had Tony Stark doing this, he looks at his Avenger buddies and he goes, guys, <laughs> I'm not just feeling it today. I, I don't want to take on Thanos. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I got to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. And then the movie ended. Would anybody go, gee, what a great film. No, you know, they'd be the turned his tail and ran. <laughs> he followed his heart. No, everybody would go. That's awful. You see, following your heart doesn't inspire people. Guarding your heart and sacrificing yourself to help and, and, and love others. That's what inspires people. And that's what Jesus does. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Iron Man's one of my favorites too, just because I like his, his snarky deadpan humor. Like that is my love language. I always get so disappointed when I see female superheroes on camera because they're always like these type A, tough, serious. And I'm like, no, I need someone like Iron Man and Ant-Man, like that snarky humor. Like I need that. That is like, (laughs) that is my spirit animal. Um, not, not really, but, uh, but no, so that's such a great point because yes, here we're seeing this redemptive arc and it's so satisfying when mm-hmm. we see it come to fruition to where yeah. when it lacks it or when it just dumps off, people are outraged and they're like, no, we want this story. And that's, what's so funny is the story that they're wanting is really their, their own salvation. They want, yes, to be, yes, exactly. Want that well redemption. You know, I think, and I've, I've just been told this, I don't, I haven't verified this yet, but you know, this, this Batgirl movie that just got canceled. Have you heard of this? No, $70 million movie they can because they pre-screened it and people thought it was so bad. And one of the reasons they thought it was so bad, apparently, is because it was kind of one of these woke movies trying to, you know, put forth a political point of some kind. And it didn't resonate with people. Now, I don't think the writers of Iron Man were Christians, but Mm -mm. they knew that sacrifice is going to inspire people in a film. 
Yeah. It's the audience is going to love it. Why? Because they're living in God's world, even though they don't recognize that God exists. Yeah, no, I and I completely agree. And and that's what's so funny is there was the the movie come out that was supposed to be the retelling of Prince of Egypt. I think it was called Gods in Egypt. It was uh-huh. with um oh the buff guy from Gladiator. Um I oh yeah, name. with with uh uh, uh you're talking about Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe, thank you. Yeah. I was like yeah. he threw something at someone once. Um that's all I can think of. <laughs> uh they so they remade that movie, but the director intentionally wrote it to be a naturalistic perspective on Exodus. And the movie ultimately tanked and people hated it. And I'm like, well, that makes perfect sense because you took God out of it. Everybody wanted to yeah. go meet and see God's work. And instead you offered a naturalistic perspective and it bombed. And it's, I think, I think, didn't that happen with Buzz Lightyear just recently too? Uh, well, yeah, people didn't like the wokeness in that either yeah. from what I've yeah. been hearing. So, and a lot of parents are like, you know what? I, I don't want to bring my kids to see this. This isn't right. what I want from Disney. And uh, we need to get back to like 1940s Disney where you had Pinocchio and all these great <laughs> right, movies right. instilling moral and biblical truths. It's like 1940s Disney needs to come talk to 2020 Disney and like have a powwow. So, uh-huh. well, let's Yeah, see. by the I, way, I'm not saying that every one of the movies we go through in the book Hollywood Heroes is age appropriate for young kids. It's not. Right. Right. But certainly kids, when they get to be early teens or teenagers with the proper supervision, these films can be powerful pointers to the gospel. And in the book, Amy, we actually have at the end of every chapter questions that parents and or your small group leader, your youth leader can ask after you watch the movies together. That's fantastic. And what's so great is our church actually just finished up this last Sunday. They did a four part series to where they use different movies. These remember the Titans, greatest showman, peanut butter Falcon. And oh gosh, I forget the first one. And it was called an at the movies series to where they took uh-huh. clips of these movies and showed them and showed how they outlined biblical truth. And they had popcorn and Coke. It, it's such a great way for churches to bring in people who would not normally come to church and encounter the gospel in movies right. they would not expect. So that's, that's right. what yeah. I love so much about this book is it's it's not only practical and relevant to evangelism, but it also helps spiritual conversations with our kiddos after we go to the theater. Yes, so. yes. And and by the way, if you don't want your kids watching these movies, again, I, I agree with you. It's your call. Right. But if you read the book, you'll at least know the outline and you'll know what's going on in these movies and you can let your kids know so they can evangelize their friends by using the movies, even though they might not have seen them themselves. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. Right. It, it, it really does open witnessing opportunities mm-hmm. uh, in locations that they may not expect. Like when you're hanging out with your buddies, when you're in class mm-hmm. and you're talking about mm-hmm. a cool movie. Oh, wow. You know where that really is located? That's located in scripture. That's uh, right. it's, yep. it's fantastic. Well, we've got a few minutes left on this recording. I know there's other questions. And, and uh, if you want, we can record just a quick one after this one. But sure, what, yeah. before, just to make this bite size for parents, um, yeah. let's just do uh, one last thing of what are some great questions that parents can do now and just incorporate whenever they see a movie. Are there were there any questions that you saw were were relevant to each and every movie that was out there that yeah, you the, could just the, ask? Well, the big thing is uh, sacrifice. Okay. The sacrifice that all of these superheroes go through in order to save people is what resonates with audiences. Mm-hmm. And that's, of course, what Jesus does for us. He sacrifices himself to take our punishment on himself so we don't have to be punished for what we've done. He takes our punishment away from us and puts it on himself. And that's what so many of these superhero and fantasy heroes do. They take any punishment they 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 get involved in saving people from dangerous uh, situations in order to bring them to a safe place. That's what they do. That's what Christ does for us. So sacrifice is the key to all of these. That would be the question I'd say, what did you like about uh, Harry Potter's sacrifice or Iron Man sacrifice or Frodo's sacrifice, or what did they do that inspired you? And it will be something from the Bible, actually. Mm-hmm. That's what you're going to find. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, mamas and papas, we have got more to cover. We're going to be looking at Anakin. We're going to be looking at Spider-Man. We've got all your great movies that we're going to be discussing here shortly. So stay tuned. If you haven't already, please pick up a copy of Frank Turek and his son's wonderful book, Hollywood Heroes, so that you can spark great conversations to have with your kiddos the next time you are watching a movie. Thank you, Frank. And we'll be back soon. Thanks, Amy. 